Today we want to discover how the Quattro all-wheel drive system was created at Audi, how the name Quattro came up and which people were involved and how. Because later a number of people claimed to have invented Quattro at Audi, but we want to discover the story in detail. In the first two parts you learned about the previous all-wheel drive projects at Audi and Auto Union. The story goes back to the DKW F9 from the 1930s. An offer by the Auto Union to convert it to all-wheel drive in 1941 during the Second World War and to the war experienced Auto Union engineers who developed the Munga after the war as the new standard vehicle for the new German army. In 1975 Ferdinand Piech, grandson of Ferdinand Porsche, became Audi's new CTO. The German military needed a new standard vehicle within two years because the Munga was outdated with its weak two-stroke engine. Mercedes said they can do it, but not in two years. This is what will become the Mercedes G-Wagon later on. Piech said they can do it in two years and gave the project to his young capable engineer Roland Gumpert. Gumpert developed the Audi 50 so far, which had to be handed over to VW, where it became the VW Polo. And currently, he was developing the Audi Superbike Z02 with the 1100cc and 1300cc four-cylinder engines of the Audi 50. Audi wanted to re-establish themselves in the top motorbike category since their previous brands DKW and NSU used to be the world's biggest motorcycle manufacturers in the past. So for the military car project, Gumper took the Munga basis, put in an Audi 80 four-stroke engine and updated the all-wheel drive, which now also had lock differentials. At this time, the head of marketing, W.P. Schmidt, changed from Audi to VW and didn't want to come empty-handed and took the Iltis project with him. So although the Iltis was developed at Audi, it got the VW badge and became the new VW Iltis. Later on, when the Audi Z02 bike was presented to Schmidt, he cancelled the project saying we are no bike manufacturer. So Audi engineers didn't like mother brand VW too much at that time. Gumpert stick to his Iltis development and in the meantime Audi was looking for a new team leader at their chassis development. The HR department decided for a candidate which was Jürgen Stockmar chief editor of the German car magazine Auto Zeitung and creator of the Rex SP1 race car. He will later become the head of Audi's motorsport department during the glory quattro days. But parallel to this official process, Piech poached the capable engineer Walter Treser from Pirelli to Audi for the same job. And this internal competition is something Piech learned from his grandfather Porsche and he used it throughout his career an internal competition and the best will win. So on 2nd of January 1977, the two candidates Stockmar and Treser meet in the Ingolstadt office and realize that they are employed for the same job. Difference was just that Stockmar had the official job, Treser didn't have a desk, phone or anything. All that sorted itself out during the next days and they split their projects. In the meantime, the so-called Winterfahrt happened in Scandinavia. Until today this is a test drive in winter conditions where the latest developments are tested and presented to the management. When Piech arrived at Audi, he wanted to position Audi higher as a competitor for BMW and Mercedes, which was very optimistic at that time. After the 917 project, because of which the family Porsche decided to not allow any Porsche family members in an active role, Piech started his own design office and developed a 5-cylinder diesel engine for Mercedes. With this experience, now at Audi, the idea came up to put in a 5-cylinder turbo engine in the Audi 100, upgrade it a bit and call it Audi 200, so people know it's positioned higher. A straight 6-cylinder engine would have been too long because of the old DKW F9 concept. The 5-cylinder could just fit because they pushed the cooling to the side. The turbo technology closed the power gap to the 6-cylinders of the competition. So the Audi 200 with the 5 cylinder turbo engine, 170 horsepower and front wheel drive was the next big thing. And it was participating at the winter test drive in January 1977. Also there was Gumpert with his 75 horsepower Iltis. And while all other front wheel drive cars were struggling in the snow, no matter how much power they had, the Iltis with its 75 horsepower was by far the fastest and safe to drive. 
Gumpert, the father of the Iltis, and Jörg Benzinger, head of the suspension test department, were discussing that an Iltis with more power would be amazing. At the end of January 1977, so four weeks after Walter Treser started at Audi, Benzinger came back to Ingolstadt and discussed it with Walter Treser, who was now head of the vehicle concept department. He told him about the idea of a powerful Iltis and told Treser to make a concept car. Treser didn't like the idea of a high-powered Iltis with short wheelbase, high center of gravity and lots of weight. He wanted to create a low, lighter car with lots of power and all-wheel drive to get the power on the road. In the background, Audi developed the Audi Coupé, another one of Pierre's project to move Audi away from the boring image. So Treza said, we can use the light Coupé, put in the new powerful 5-cylinder turbo engine and the Iltis all-wheel drive system. With that, Treza and Benzinger went to Pierre, Audi's CTO at that time. Piech had a special relationship to all-wheel drive. In 1946, his uncle Ferry Porsche developed the Sis Italia 360 with all-wheel drive, and Piech remembered him saying, all-wheel drive is just to have an advantage in the rain. By the way, Ferry Porsche did this project to have enough money to get his father Ferdinand Porsche out of the French jail. The next time Piech heard about all-wheel drive was the Jensen FF. He was working at Porsche at that time and they bought two of them with the same power, one with rear-wheel drive and one with all-wheel drive to compare them. Both versions were too heavy and didn't have a good setup according to Porsche standards. The two-wheel drive version was always faster on the racetrack, so that confirmed the opinion at Porsche that all-wheel drive is only for off-road. They didn't really think about that a comparison might have been different if the all-wheel drive version was more powerful and because of all-wheel drive you could bring the power on the road. So now Benzinger and Treza are standing in front of Piech and proposing an Audi 80 prototype with extended wheelbase to match the coupé, the powerful 5-cylinder turbo engine and all-wheel drive. Piech liked the idea, but after Audi's motorbike had been cancelled by Mother VW and Audi 50 and Iltis had been snatched, Piech decided to keep the project secret without budget and project number, so Wolfsburg wouldn't know. So engineers wrote their hours on other projects. And so they built the prototype called A1 in spring 1977 completely off the radar. Advantage for Audi now was the old DKW F9 concept, which drives the front axle already. The gearbox output shaft is easy to reach because it's already behind the front axle and so they connected a prop shaft to the rear, put in the McPherson front axle at the back to drive it. Competitors couldn't build something like this easily because their engine position blocked the access to the front axle. So Audi did in spring 1977 what they already proposed for the F9 in 1941. They connected a prop shaft to the back. But in contrast to other all-wheel drive systems, the task was to keep the weight low, to improve performance in every situation, not just on gravel and snow, to make this work in all Audi cars and to also improve safety. In autumn 1977, the A1 prototype was finished and they compared it to the new Porsche 928 on the Hockenheim ring, where the weird Audi 80 prototype with less horsepower was faster than the V8 Porsche in dry conditions. At the end of 1977, Piech himself took the A1 prototype to the snowy Arlberg in Austria and was amazed what he could do with the car. Now he was convinced and wanted to bring this car on the road. But they needed a good plan to confess to VW what they developed in secret and to convince the people from Wolfsburg that this prototype, which had many internal critics already at Audi and essentially no one wanted and no one needed, is a good idea. After all, there was the so-called Beherrschungsvertrag, which means Audi is only allowed to develop and build what VW tells them to. So first they needed to convince VW's head of marketing, W.P. Schmidt, so that man who snatched the Iltis project before and cancelled Audi's motorbike project. It was January 1978 and Piech was well prepared. First, he lured Schmidt to Austria by inviting him to see the latest winter tire development. The evening before the test drive, they organized a nice Austrian dinner in a top-notch restaurant. The next morning, they showed him the A1 prototype and he took a test drive with Piech. 
This happened at the Turacher Höhe in Austria, the steepest snowy road in Europe. Coincidentally, they met some test engineers of a snow chain manufacturer at a steep part of the track, who recognized Piech. After some small talk, they told him and Schmidt about their excellent snow chains and offered a test drive in their vehicle. Piech and Schmidt took a quick spin in their car with one driven axle and snow chains and politely complimented their products. Piech and Schmidt then got into the A1 prototype and jaw-droppingly steamed up the snowy hill without chains and with summer tires. Also Schmidt was now convinced that they needed to build this car. The A1 had an official project number already for two months at this point and Schmidt asked Piech how many of these he wants to sell. Piech said 400. Schmidt answered, who should I sell 400 of these things? Anyway, he was on board. Piech said he wants to sell 400 because that was the requirement for the homologation to be able to use the car in motorsport, so he already thought ahead. The next important person they needed to convince was the VW Group CTO Ernst Fiala, basically Piech's boss because Piech was only Audi CTO at that time. They gave the A1 prototype to Fiala for a weekend to drive home to Vienna. Fiala liked the car and just like all other engineers before, including CTO Piech and project leader Tresa, he was okay with the missing misdifferential and hence the tensions in the drivetrain at tight turns. The engineers thought for such a special car with such special technology for a limited production number, that's okay. Then, at this weekend in Vienna, Fiala's wife wanted to go to the city center for shopping and Fiala gave her the A1 prototype. She drove into a multi-story car park to the fifth floor. When she wanted to leave the car park, she drove down through the tight turn ramp and the missing mid-differential and hence tensions in the drivetrain made the car jump. She went back to her husband and complained about the jumping car. Monday morning, Fiala was back with the car and said to Piech and Tresa, Nice project, but you cannot sell the jumping car. All they needed from Fiala was that he is at least neutral and not against the project. They would care about the jumping later. Next person to convince was the big boss, VW CEO Tony Schmücker. The problem was now the German underground terror organization RAF, which was very active with kidnapping and killings of business leaders at that time and also Schmücker was pretty high up on their list. It was May 1978, so snow, to really show what the A1 prototype can do, was only in high mountains. It was too risky to bring Schmücker to Turach to Austria, so they needed a new idea. In Germany, many people in the countryside are active in the voluntary firefighters. And so, one of the local Audi engineers got the idea that his firefighter group could water a steep grass hill in Lenting, close to Ingolstadt. So, they could still show the advantages of the all-wheel drive A1 prototype, even in summer conditions. So, they invited Schmücker and it was a huge effort to even get him there. The police was checking and observing the area for days before the test. The area was completely closed off and even a helicopter was monitoring from above. A huge police convoy arrived with Schmücker. There were three cars prepared for him. A BMW 7 Series with rear-wheel drive, the new Audi 200 Turbo with front-wheel drive and the boring-looking A1 prototype. Schmücker didn't really know what this was all about, asked the engineers what they want him to do and was grumpy that he had to drive the BMW up the hill where he would obviously get stuck very quickly. So at the beginning of the hill he already came to a stop with spinning wheels. He came back, changed to the Audi 200 Turbo with front rear drive and said, now I will show you what our latest car can do. He accelerated hard but didn't make it much further. His mood got worse. And now you want me to drive in this thing? Pointing at the old and much smaller Audi 80. The engineers already thought this project is over, because he wasn't in the mood and he didn't really accelerate much. Only at the beginning of the hill he gave full throttle and the small A1 prototype stormed up the hill. Schmücker was impressed, came back and the engineers explained everything to him. He was convinced that they should bring this car on the road. Only now the project became the official development project 262 and Schmücker granted a budget of 3 million D-Mark. The plan was clear. They wanted to bring a special version of the Audi Coupé with this all-wheel drive and as much power as possible. 
they now increased the target from 160 horsepower to 200 horsepower. The homework they still needed to do was to figure out the name and to solve the jumping issue. So the engine department worked on increasing the power and the gearbox department brainstormed how to integrate a mid-differential without increasing weight and the size of the gearbox too much. The gearbox was a two-shaft design, with the front diff at the front and the connection to the rear at the back. If they wanted to integrate a mid-differential, it made sense to connect it to the output shaft at the back, so the prop shaft to the rear axle could be connected there directly. The problem with this was just how do you get the power to the front axle if the mid-differential sits at the back? An external shaft to the front would have been too big and heavy. Head of the gearbox design department, Franz Tengler, got the genius idea. The gearbox's output shaft doesn't have to be solid, it can be hollow. That way, the shaft to the front axle can go through the output shaft and connect to the front differential. That was it. The mid-differential could be integrated in a very efficient way and the jumping problem was solved. That was the solution which solved all problems and it worked surprisingly well from the very beginning. They now had a very capable, compact and light all-wheel drive system. They just needed a name for it. Mother brand VW always wanted to make all decisions and they already had a name for it. Karat, which stands for Coupé, Allrad, Antrieb, Turbo. In the meantime, project leader Tresa tried to find a simple name which works in every language and very easily tells people what is so special about this car. He came up with Quadro, which means four in a lot of languages for four-wheel drive and is similar to Quadrat in German, so square in English, which sounds like a stable platform. He went to Pierre, who liked the idea, but said Quadro sounds too soft and it needs to be a bit rougher for what the car can do. It would be better with a double T, so the Quattro name was born, by the way, always in lower case. So Piech took Tresa with him to Wolfsburg to VW's highest marketing meeting to present their name for the car, Quattro. In preparation of the meeting, Tresa found out that Karat is actually also the name of a sheep perfume and he brought a bottle of it to the meeting. He put it on the table and asked the VW people if they really want to name this amazing car like a sheep perfume. He has a better name for it, Quattro. Everyone agreed on Quattro, the VW marketing people hated the Audi people for it for a long time, but a legend was born. In the next part we will discover how exactly Audi developed the project further for the first production Audi Quattro with all its quirks. I hope you enjoyed this look back in history and if you want to support the channel, please consider to become a B-Sport Club member for early access and more videos like this. See you at the next video.